Great. Um, so the objectives of this about next half hour is to talk about some of the um, atypical uh, presentations of celiac disease. I'll be referring to them in this presentation as extraintestinal manifestations. So here, are about these are the nine that I'd like to talk about. Um, we'll talk about some of their causes and how they are linked to celiac disease. And there is some research also about how they may respond to a gluten-free diet. So I wanted to start by giving you some of the real life stories that I see in my clinic. So I, there's been a four-year-old girl, she presented with a right swollen ankle and she in fact came to the GI clinic referred from the rheumatology clinic because of her swollen ankle that prompted doing the celiac screen that was positive. An eight-year-old girl that had a history of a broken arm after falling from a, at the playground and the fall wasn't especially um, at a uh, quite high elevation and she also had quite very mild abdominal pain a 10-year-old girl who just complained of numbness and tingling in the mouth, and that was what prompted the physician to do the celiac screen. A 12-year-old boy with a history of intermittent aphthous ulcers in the mouth, as well as hip pain. And a three-year-old boy, he was quite fatigued, lots of napping. Mum um, had noticed no weight change over the last year. Uh, he was stooling lots through the day, not necessarily loose, but lots of stools. And then on his blood work, in fact, was found to have a mild hepatitis. So we used to think back in the mid 70s that celiac disease was prim primarily a malabsorptive disease in children less than two years of age with chronic recurrent diarrhea, distension of the abdomen, poor growth. We now know that there are many extra that celiac presents with many symptoms, many of them affecting any organ of the body. Celiac can, can present at any age and across many ethnicities. And about 50% of teenagers um, when studied, present with atypical symptoms of celiac disease. But interestingly, many of the toddlers and like, um, will still present with some of the more classic features. And the delay in the diagnosis may partly be due to these extraintestinal manifestations that don't always prompt in, um, the physician or the, the person to think about celiac disease. So one of the goals of uh, months like these is to raise awareness about these extraintestinal features of celiac disease. And in celiac disease may in fact be the only feature, uh, the extraintestinal manifestations may in fact be the only feature of celiac disease or they can occur uh, together with diarrhea and abdominal pain. This was a study uh, from the University of Chicago, their celiac clinic, and they were looking at how effective is the gluten-free diet uh, on these extraintestinal manifestations in adults and children. And they reviewed the charts over the last 12 years and they found that in adults, 62 of them presented with uh, uh, extraintestinal features with iron deficiency anemia being more common. And 60% of children uh, presented with extraintestinal features and short stature and a third, fatigue and headaches. And interestingly, about 20, almost 20% 20 of children only presented with extraintestinal manifestations of celiac disease. Any of these uh, references, any of these um, research articles that I refer to, I do provide the reference on the bottom so you can uh, read and read those in more detail if you'd like. This is a busy slide, but I think it's also very informative because we do, we understand a lot about what, what is happening at the intestinal level uh, in patients with celiac disease. So celiac is a unique autoimmune disease. It involves the, an external trigger, and that is the dietary gluten. Um, and that is so in figure one, number one there, um, and that gluten leads to increased intestinal permeability. And then that leads to activation of the immune system where you, such as pro, cytokines, such as IL-15, and enzyme modification by the tissue transglutaminase, and that's pictured in um, number three there. And then these modified gluten peptides are presented to the immune system uh, through the APC, stands for antigen presenting cells, uh, via these HLA proteins. And we know that 99% of celiac patients are either HLA DQ2 or DQ8 positive. And this then ultimately leads to activation of uh, T cells and then as well as other uh, the B cells and producing antibodies. And then we think that some of these extraintestinal features of celiac disease are in fact uh, some of these immune factors, such as the T cells migrating to uh, different uh, parts of the body. So we, so there's 
we think that some of the extraintestinal features are due to the autoimmunity, and in particular, dermatitis herpetiformis and glutenataxia, while other extraintestinal features are likely due to the nutritional consequences of having celiac disease that is active. So this diagram here on the left is a image of a small intestinal duodenum uh, that is normal. Normally, the bowel has tall microvilli that allows for a large surface area of absorption of nutrients. And on the right-hand side would be uh, a patient with modified MARSH 3C criteria, so very severe um, uh, atrophy of the villi. And then that would affect absorption of various nutrients. So for anemia, that for iron absorption, calcium, vitamin D, and also uh, short stature also would be, a, um, would be a consequence of these malabsorption of the nutrients. So now moving on, uh, first I'd like to start with talking about anemia. So just, uh, I usually, I'll start usually with each topic just as a sort of a brief definition. So anemia usually refers to a condition when your blood has less than the normal number of red blood cells. And iron is a very essential mineral to properly form your hemoglobin molecule. So patients who are anemic, can be quite fatigued, and in children, that can be manifested with them napping more often. They can, with severe anemia, people can look pale, they can have dizziness, weakness, and if um, they may have quite fast heart rates and shortness of breath. And so we think that uh, there's multiple causes of anemia in patients with celiac disease. Uh, as I mentioned before, malabsorption of nutrients is probably a, a very large cause of that with iron deficiency anemia and malabsorption of iron with the atrophy of the mucosa. Um, some patients with uh, celiac disease, when you scope them, you see that they have a red, uh, red areas in their duodenum, and you can imagine that that probably leads to some small amounts of blood loss. And then also, if you recall the, the picture I showed you of that um, of the intestine and all the pathways that we understand, there's a lot of inflammatory proteins that are activated in the intestines of patients with celiac disease who are eating gluten. And so that inflammation we call in, um, uh, can lead to anemia of chronic disease, and that's seen in about 25% of patients. So there are various causes of anemia. If and how do you test for it? So you, you test for anemia on a blood test. And this in particular, we're going to be talking about iron deficiency anemia. It is the more common type of anemia in patients with celiac disease. Other types of anemia, which I won't talk about today, include um, folic, folic deficiency and vitamin B12 deficiency. Those can also lead to anemia. But here we're talking about iron deficiency anemia as it's most common. So CBC stands for your complete blood count. And on that, you would have a low hemoglobin number. And the picture on the bottom here, on the bottom left would be a normal blood smear, and on the, on the bottom right would be a blood smear of somebody with iron deficiency anemia. And those patients have red blood cells that are small, we call them microcytic, and they're a bit paler than normal, and those are hypochromic. And then also on your iron studies, your serum iron level would be low, your serum transferrin saturation is low. Transferrin is the molecule that moves iron around to different tissues. And so it's not very saturated with iron. And so the, the saturation is low. That's kind of how I remember it. And then your iron binding capacity is high, meaning you have lots of capacity to buy iron because you don't have lots of iron around uh, circulating in your blood. So that's what you might see on iron studies. And the ferritin can be quite low. So if you're worried that you might have iron deficiency anemia, doing a CBC, iron studies, and ferritin is definitely one way to start to test for it. And as I already alluded to, iron deficiency anemia is common in patients with celiac disease. It is more common in adults than children. Um, but depending on what references you look at, uh, I sh the, first ref the first article I was telling you about, the adults had about almost 40% of them had, iron had anemia. Uh, here it's about 15%. It, it does vary, but certainly a, a larger number of adults have iron deficiency anemia and about 3% of children. And if they've done studies where they've just screened children who've presented to a hematology clinic and, uh, for iron deficiency anemia, and 4% of them ultimately have celiac disease. And uh, patients with, iron with anemia do have more severe intestinal injury. And that makes sense, as I showed you those previous diagrams of the flattened villi and, and how that then ultimately leads to poor iron absorption. So in patients um, who don't correct their iron levels uh, 
quickly with iron supplementation or they keep having recurrent iron deficiency every time they come off their iron supplements, then that would, those, those conditions would warrant testing for celiac disease. Moving now on to bone health. Uh, so before I go on, I wanna just go over some definitions uh, uh, for when uh, bone mineral, mineral density is reported. In adults, it's reported as a T-score. And that is when it compares the result of the patient to other healthy young adults. And in children, that, re that uh, is reported as a Z-score. So it compares that result to other children that same gender and age. Um, and so the diagrams here on the bottom show you, um, you and you'll see this um, also when I talk about the growth curves, it, generally we talk about how many standard deviations you are away from the mean. So the mean is zero. And as you move further away from the mean, you are either one, minus one standard deviation, minus two standard deviations, and osteoporosis is uh, defined as a greater than minus 2.5 standard deviations below the mean. So at diagnosis, about a third of adults have osteoporosis. The image on the right here shows, the top one shows sort of normal healthy bone with lots of uh, bone matrix there, and the bottom picture would be a, a depiction of a bone with osteoporosis. In children, about 15% of children uh, at diagnosis have a Z-score that is less than minus two, meaning they're greater than two standard deviations uh, away from the mean of uh, other healthy children. And children who are at greater risk of having low bone mineral density are those that are diagnosed over 10 years of age. And you may, patients may have low bone mineral density that either have symptoms of uh, abdominal pain or diarrhea or those that in fact don't have any such symptoms. And in adults, the risk factors for bone mineral density include um, at, uh, older age at diagnosis, a lower BMI at diagnosis, and being diagnosed after menopause. So some of the causes of bone, uh, of bone disease and celiac. So uh, again, the micronutrient malabsorption. So when you don't absorb your calcium very well due to the atrophy of the villi, that then sends a signal to your high to your parathyroid gland to start stimulating. It sends a signal saying, hey, you know what, we don't have enough calcium, release more parathyroid hormone, and then that hormone acts on the bones to release the calcium. And the second mechanism is that chronic inflammation, those, all the, that IL-15, those proteins that I was showing you in that, that diagram, those, that chronic inflammation also leads to resorption of bone. And you may ask, so how, how can, we, how can we detect this? I mean, there's no specific symptoms until something is broken. Um, and one of the reasons why we promote screening of patients like first degree relatives to, uh, to prevent uh, long-term consequences of bone disease. Uh, fortunately, when they've done studies looking at children and youth, they have found no increased evidence of risk of fractures um, in patients who then go glu are gluten-free. Uh, so that is good news for children. And treatment of bone health. So there's many factors in the treatment. Uh, obviously, strictly adhering to a gluten-free diet is one of the main factors because patients who continue to have atrophy of their villi in their intestines will then uh, continue to have uh, issues with their bone. Um, I always make sure that my patients eat enough uh, calcium-containing products uh, and that they take vitamin D, especially we live here in Alberta. And for many six months of the year, we don't have enough sunlight. So about 43% of children uh, in a study here in uh, Alberta did have suboptimal levels of vitamin D at diagnosis. And about a quarter of them still had low levels of vitamin D at, uh, on a gluten-free diet. So I usually recommend vitamin D supplementation um, at baseline. Obviously, continuing to stay active uh, is another way to ensure uh, healthy, healthy bones. And in children, we do see that their bones do show a dramatic improvement uh, even one year after a gluten-free diet, but it probably takes a few years for their bones to ultimately become as strong as their peers. If you would like to hear more about bone health, because I've just given you a snapshot of information, um, the CCA is hosting a webinar next Tuesday, May 29th. Uh, on bone and along with the Osteoporosis Society. It's a full hour with just Dr. Justine Turner 
and it'll be at 6 p.m. and 9 p.m. Eastern, Eastern Standard Time. So it's one hour devoted to just bones because it's a really big topic. Moving on, uh, now about arthritis and arthralgias. So again, now if you screen, if you just screen children who present to a rheumatology clinic, about 2% of them end up having celiac disease. And 60% of those children only present with complaints of their joints with no other classic gastrointestinal manifestations. Uh, here was a study where they actually did ultrasounds on newly diagnosed patients, and they found that about a third of them had, had joint changes uh, with joint effusions. Of, effusion is uh, fluid accumulation in the joint. That, that was seen most commonly. I mean, these patients were not symptomatic, um, and so this wasn't something that they were complaining about, but they were just simply screening them with ultrasounds. So it is again, a common extraintestinal manifestations of, of celiac disease. What I wanted to uh, remind everyone here is that celiac disease being an autoimmune condition also has um, increased risk for other autoimmune conditions, such as juvenile idiopathic arthritis or rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, the picture here on the right shows uh, a joint diffusion, so the, the knee with the red arrow, you can see that you've kind of lost the margins of the patella, they're swelling, and that's what you might see in a patient with, with arthritis, whether it's um, an, an autoimmune condition like JIA or from celiac, so they present with joint pain, swelling, stiffness, and in particular, juvenile idiopathic arthritis can also present with fever and rashes. So again, in my patients with celiac disease, if they then alt, if they develop joint issues, after being diagnosed with celiac, then this is some of the stuff that I may think about um, if they have developed another autoimmune condition. Moving on now to dermatitis herpetiformis. This is probably one of the most fascinating, uh, fascinating as extraintestinal manifestations of celiac disease. Um, I have to say it's not very common in pediatrics, but the way that I've encountered it in my clinic is in fact the parents. I remember uh, one, uh, one dad saying that mom has such an itchy rash on her hands that if we could just figure out what that itchy rash was, that that would be so helpful. And in fact, I was seeing the child for, C for a newly diagnosed celiac disease. So this rash is, like I mentioned, very, very itchy. Um, it's these vesicles that are on in a symmetric distribution, often on the elbows, the knees. Um, sometimes this child is pictured on the back. Rarely do patients with DH have a lot of GI symptoms. They may have more minor symptoms such as bloating, for example. And if a patient is suspected of having DH, you can, you can confirm the diagnosis with a skin biopsy. And the biopsy is done usually around the lesions. And you don't necessarily need a GI biopsy. Um, if the patient does have a lot of GI symptoms, then that may be indicated, but it's not necessary. And the treatment for this is the treatment for this is the uh, gluten-free diet, and some patients are also placed on Dapsone as this um, rash is so itchy, and in fact, the itchiness takes longer to resolve. Moving now on to short stature, again, I wanted to just start with uh, a bit of a definition. So short stature can be defined as a height that is more than two standard deviations below the mean, or the height of a child that is less than it expected for weight compared to other children of the same age. One way to try to estimate if your child is growing to along their, or what their estimated target height might be, um, we call that a mid-parental height. So for girls, you would take the dad's height minus 13 centimeters plus the mom's height divided by two. And for boys, you would take the mom's height plus 13 centimeters plus the dad's height divided by two. I think it's really, really important that when we talk about growth in children, that it's something that you follow over time. Um, because, uh, and that is, that's the next slide that I wanted to show here. These are, uh, this growth, her, growth curve, the WHO growth charts. Um, these are, this one I downloaded from Dietitians Canada, which you, uh, it's uh, easy, easily downloadable. So if you are worried about your child's growth, you could simply measure them at home, and then you can plot them on this growth, growth curve that you can download. Because I, that's one of the key features is following growth over, of children over time. The image on the bottom right simply gives a, a little bit of an idea of how much a child is expected to grow through various phases of their 
uh, childhood. And as you can see, between one to four years of age, there's quite a big uh, amount of growth of 10 centimeters on average per year, and then uh, about five centimeters in that uh, in those years from kindergarten till about grade three, and then about five centimeters a year after that. So these are quite good resources. If you're worried about your child, you can access these, um, these growth charts. There are separate ones for boys, girls. This one on this image is from girls from two to 19, year, 19 years of age, and there's separate growth curves from uh, zero to two years of age. So when you think of short stature, there really are many causes. And uh, I'll and I'll use this diagram on the right to try to illustrate some of the more common ones. So constitutional delay is a very common cause of short stature. That would be, for example, uh, someone who their mom or dad was a late bloomer, somebody who um, was growing, uh, growing uh, slowly. Usually they, they are normal size at birth and their growth slows down between three to five years of age. The child grows uh, consistently, but is found to be shorter than their peers, and then they really take off uh, once they hit puberty. And that's um, depicted on, in A on the figure there. Familiar short stature is also very common, and that is um, where you, you have shorter parents, and you calculate the mid-parental height, and you find that, yes, you know, in fact, the child is growing along uh, their target, uh, target height, and that's depicted in B. And then uh, are the pathological causes. So there's the list of these causes is very long and I have not given you uh, a complete li list by no means, but uh, one big category is our hormonal causes such as growth hormone deficiency, we call those endocrine causes. And then there are the non-endocrine causes, sort of other chronic diseases. Uh, in, in the gastrointestinal realm, we think of Crohn's disease as a, quite a common cause of short stature in, kid, in children, celiac disease, uh, chronic kidney disease. So here I'm just naming a few. The list is quite long. And that's depicted in the red diagram. You can see that the child is growing, but then they all of a sudden stop growing. And that's where it's so important to follow the growth of the child over time. Because you may have a child who's growing along the 10th percentile the whole over the years, and that's their percentile. They're growing normally. And you may have another child who goes from the uh, 75th to the 25th percentile, but that may be... Um, uh, suggestion of a pathological cause for their uh, growth failure. And again, growth, short stature may be the only presenting symptom of celiac disease. Uh, up to 8% of children who are investigated for short stature uh, are ultimately found to have celiac disease. There are many causes. There are some causes related to the, uh, to the brain endocrine axis, such as in decreased insulin growth factor, malnutrition, as I've mentioned, and impaired secretion of growth hormone. Fortunately for children, many of them, about 65%, do show catch-up growth. And you see that especially in the first year after being diagnosed and going gluten-free. And I think it's really important to remember that if you do not see a child that is showing good catch-up growth on a gluten-free diet, that it, uh, about 35%, so 65% show catch-up growth. The other group of children who didn't show catch-up growth were found to have other medical concerns. Uh, some may have been diagnosed also with inflammatory bowel disease, um, growth hormone deficiency, maybe they're not eating as well. So I think it's important to follow the growth after, being, uh, after following a gluten-free diet and ensuring that the child uh, shows catch-up growth. Moving now on to hepatitis. So briefly again, I'll just talk about some definitions. So when we talk about hepatitis, we talk about liver enzymes such as the ALT and AST, and those reflect liver cell injury. And uh, the normal values of these two tests vary by laboratory, which is actually a bit of a confusing thing. But generally, it's, it's thought about that in boys, around a number of 25 international units per liter is normal or, you know, or less, and in teenage girls, about 22. Um, and so then uh, these tests do not reflect how much the liver is functioning. And, in, and they're also not liver specific. They can come from the intestines. They can come from the muscles. So if a child is found to have an elevated ALT and ASD, the first thing would be to repeat the test because the, there, there are other common causes uh, where you might see a slight elevation. And then if you, the child continues to have high elevations in these, in these values, then there's a whole list of possibilities to explore. And that depends on how, how elevated the ALT and AST are. 
So when talking about celiac hepatitis, this is associated with active celiac disease, and about 20% of newly diagnosed patients may have mild changes in their ALT and AST. And I think it's really key to remember that these are mild changes. These patients don't have evidence of large livers or large spleens with chronic liver disease that would not be typical of celiac hepatitis. There are not any symptoms usually with celiac hepatitis. It's something that's picked up incidentally on, incidentally on blood work. And in fact, somebody might have had it uh, ALT and AST done, which then might prompt the celiac screen. And this um, celiac hepatitis can develop in symptomatic and asymptomatic patients. Some of the causes, now this is, uh, uh, some of the causes might involve um, metabolic consequences of being malnourished. We know that patients who are malnourished may have a fatty liver, in fact. The, the only interesting thing is that we know that fewer children are presenting with mal, uh, malnourished nowadays compared to back in the 70s, but yet we still see 20% of patients on average with celiac hepatitis. So an alternate hypothesis may be that when there's increased intestinal permeability, that may lead, for, uh, lead to passage of these cytokines and antigens, uh, and they're from the intestine, they're absorbed um, through the portal vein, and about two-thirds of the blood supply to the liver comes from the intestine. So all that blood from the intestine comes to the liver, and maybe that's how um, that's the pathophysiology of celiac hepatitis. Um, the severity of the intestinal damage doesn't correlate with how, how high the ALT and AST are. And the important thing to note is that if it's celiac hepatitis, it normalizes on a gluten-free diet within a year. And if the numbers stay elevated, or if they're really elevated to start, then it's important to think of an alternate cause. And this is uh, leading into that because patients with celiac disease uh, also have uh, increased risk of developing autoimmune hepatitis. Um, primary biliary cirrhosis is a condition uh, in adults, and primary uh, sclerosis and cholangitis can be in pediatrics as well. But I think it's important to, to keep in mind that, um, that if the numbers stay high, to think of alternate diagnoses, and also patients with these liver disorders are at high risk of celiac disease. So it actually goes uh, back and forth. The patients with any of these conditions do present with being tired, tummy pain, uh, yellow eyes, yellow skin. They might even have frequent bloody noses. So they, they, here these patients may present with symptoms, but they may also be asymptomatic. So I think that's important to keep in mind that celiac disease may have its own liver manifestations, but also celiac disease is associated with other autoimmune conditions. Moving on to uh, oral uh, symptoms. So the, uh, Image A here shows a depiction of aphthous ulcers, and I find this actually quite a common uh, clinical manifestation. And also, I find some patients who accidentally consume gluten on a, when they're on a gluten-free diet may only develop aphthous ulcers, and that may be their only sign that they've actually been cross-contaminated. And the image on uh, here in B depicts uh, dental enamel defects, and both of these uh, oral symptoms uh, improve on a gluten-free diet. Moving on to neurological causes, uh, these uh, are co more common in children with celiac disease than uh, controls. So when they've studied that, uh, the list of causes for these are, is, is even longer, whether it's cross-reaction of antibodies or immune complexes that are, that are deposited in the brain, or are there direct neurotoxicity of some of these uh, proteins on the brain, or is it related to malabsorption of vitamins such as vitamin B12? Um, headaches and migraines are, as I mentioned, about 20% of children had headaches, um, and that is more than just simply uh, patients without, children without celiac disease. And after starting a gluten-free diet, about a quarter of children have complete resolution of their headaches, and others have significant improvement. Uh, I've listed here other neurological symptoms. Um, peripheral neuropathy is not as commonly seen in children, uh, but up to 50% of adults may have peripheral neuropathy. And aside from the headaches, um, the response of the, to the gluten-free diet for these other symptoms is conflicting. And finally, uh, just one slide here on fertility. So, because um, that seems to be a, a question that I get asked as well, uh, celiac disease is more prevalent in women with unexplained uh, inf infertility. And when they've pulled studies, about 3% of uh, women with unexplained infertility, in fact, are ultimately diagnosed with celiac disease. And the fortunate part is that this reverse, this infertility reverses on the gluten-free diet. 
And I'd like to just uh, one key point sort of unrelated, related unrelated is that women of childbearing age who are on a gluten-free diet should take a folic acid supplement. And that is because not all gluten-free foods are folate fortified as are uh, wheat-based foods. So uh, I've alluded to the study already before. They looked here at uh, the response of these extraintestinal manifestations to a gluten-free diet. And as you can see, the blue is the pediatric patients that were in that study, the, the orange is the adult patients. Dermatitis herpetiformis, 100% of patients uh, respond to gluten-free diet, as do um, mouth sores in pediatrics, myalgias, um, uh, hair loss. Hair loss is actually not as common in pediatrics, more, more in adult patients. The liver enzymes improve, but when you move to the right, you can see that the psychiatric symptoms uh, may not uh, necessarily improve the same. So some of the key points that I wanted to make is that uh, extra intestinal manifestations of celiac disease are common and that they can lead to a delay in the diagnosis. Many of these manifestations do improve or even ultimately resolve on a gluten-free diet. Some of these extra intestinal manifestations are very specific for celiac disease, such as dermatitis or pediformis, and others have a longer list of possibilities, such as the uh, hepatitis, for example, or short stature. So if you have concerns uh, that your child may have celiac disease, a celiac screen is a very simple blood test. It's quick, it's easy to do, and the results are usually available within a week. Um, so I would encourage you that if, you, if, you, if you're worried about celiac disease, to, ask, to speak to your doctor to have your child or yourself screened. Thank you. So my name is Jessica. I'm a registered dietitian. I work out of the Stollery Children's Hospital in Edmonton. And my portion tonight was talking about um, getting started on a gluten-free diet for your child after their diagnosis of celiac disease. Um, my goal for this part of the presentation was just to give you some tips on starting on a gluten-free diet, some basic things to think about, and it was really meant to be quite introductory, not super detailed. I could definitely spend an extra hour talking about all the little nitty gritty bits about reading ingredients and labels and so I think there's definitely time and place for that but maybe not for tonight. So this is a picture of me. I'm a registered dietitian. I do have a strong interest in celiac disease and allergies, um, picky eaters, selective eaters, and I don't have celiac disease myself, but I do like trying gluten-free products, and um, I'm really jazzed to be here with you all tonight and uh, with the Canadian Celiac Association. So I think the first thing that I would recommend to parents with kids who are newly diagnosed is just to breathe and take a second. It's a lifelong diet. And I know from a lot of different places, you're gonna hear dietitians and doctors and nurses saying, you have to be 100% gluten-free and this is what you're gonna take out. And even if you're the most motivated parent ever, um, starting this diet can definitely be stressful. So thinking about how you might manage that stress and go about it is really helpful. And then I would recommend explaining this to your child at an age appropriate level about what's going on. So there are some children's books about celiac disease or even allergies that we could use to help read to younger children um, and older teens, you know, take that time away from their siblings or try to find some time where you can have a discussion with them as much as possible. Um, and really, I can't emphasize enough how important it is to try to stay positive, especially in front of your child. Um, I will not forget the family who came in who were so excited and pumped and they said, we're really excited because we actually have a diagnosis and we have a reason for why all these things have been happening. And we're really excited to try new recipes and make sure um, you know, our child is feeling better. And I thought that was a great outlook to have, especially in front of their, um, their child. And then on the other side of things, we do often see parents who, you know, the first thing out of their mouths is kind of like, oh, my child loves bread and they're going to have such a hard time changing over and they kind of tend to make some um, reasons or, you know, voice some reasons as to why their child won't be able to follow a gluten-free diet. And I absolutely understand having these doubts and hesitations, but if possible, I would recommend voicing them to your doctor or dietitian in private or on the phone rather than in front of your child because they can definitely pick up on these things. And in some ways that might make it okay for them not to be compliant with the diet. Um, so, you know, we're here to help you through it, but 
staying positive can make a big difference. Absolutely, accidents and mistakes will happen. And that's how we learn about what can and can't happen or what foods may have contained gluten that we didn't know about. And that's okay. Again, we want to try to frame it as an experience to learn from. And uh, one of the most basic things you can do with your child is start teaching them to ask if food contains gluten. Um, you know, in this day and age, it's, I had another patient last week who said that when she was at a friend's house, if she was offered food she didn't know, then her friend's mom could just text her mom a picture of the photo. And I thought that was such a, or sorry, a photo of the label. Um, and I thought that was such a great idea and uh, a relatively easy thing to do as well outside of the house. So we recommend trying to find your own um, support system, whether that's through your registered dietitian um, and your GI team, or reaching out to family or friends with celiac disease. The Canadian Celiac Association is an excellent support. Um, I would caution if you're doing some internet searching and you know asking Dr. Google some questions, be aware of the source of information because it can definitely vary. Uh, Absolutely, the pocket dictionary or the gluten-free 24-7 app is something that we suggest in our clinic. And uh, I actually had a family last week who was so grateful that we showed them the pocket dictionary that they took my coffee and I just didn't have the heart to say that they had to buy their own coffee. So <laughs> I'll have to make a new order soon, but they just found that to be very, very useful. Um, I've seen lots of books about celiac disease and um, cookbooks at the library um, and that I definitely think that there are some great recipes and blogs to be found online as well as in local meetups. So basically for food and I know again this is really the tip of the iceberg for lots of grains and cereals we're going to look at avoiding wheat, rye, barley and non-gluten-free oats. So a lot of grains and cereals that are still whole grains, we encourage such as brown rice, quinoa, trying some new things like buckwheat or sorghum or amaranth, um, even just looking at some starchy vegetables like corn, potatoes, sweet potatoes, all of those are okay. For fruits and vegetables, we really say all are fine. We want to check things that are canned or dried or processed in any way, but if you're just going to the grocery store and looking in the produce section, all of those fruits and veggies without a label are completely fine. For proteins, it's going to be along the same line. So anything that's unprocessed, even if it says grain-fed chicken or grain-fed pork or something like that, if it's unprocessed and you're cooking it and seasoning it yourself, that should be completely fine. Eggs, lentils, uh, most peanut butters are gluten-free, but anything that's pre-made for you or is ready to open and eat from the package, we need to double check. So things like hot dogs, deli meats, and sausages. For dairy, again, along the same lines, the less processed it is, the more likely it is to be fine and gluten-free. So a lot of milk, um, even some chocolate milk, cheeses, yogurts, most of them are okay. And again, you can get some fancy yogurts that have granola or grains mixed into those. Those would not be gluten-free for the most part. And we recommend checking flavored ice creams, um, flavored yogurts, and uh, special kinds of fancy cheeses. For many fats and oils, again, all of these in their relatively natural state are going to be fine. So olive oils, canola oil, butter, margarine, all are gluten-free. We recommend looking at cooking sprays and salad dressings and um, anything that's prepackaged and ready to use right away. And then for treats such as chips, um, chocolate, candies, there's just such a wide variety of these foods. So many different crates of candy and flavorings. Um, uh, so really, these can often contain gluten, along with other kinds of condiments and sauces and spreads and things that are ready to use. So this is where we want to delve into checking the labels all of the time. So I have this little slide in here that, uh, you know, has all of these questions that I get asked often. What about soy? What about movie theater popcorn? Can we have yeast? So these are some really common questions. Um, Again, this presentation isn't meant to be completely exhaustive and definitely just an intro, 
but uh, this is where your supports and your dietitian can help you know weed through all of these tiny little things or foods that don't come up every day. So at home I would encourage you to take this opportunity if your child's been newly diagnosed with celiac disease to do a thorough clean of your kitchen and likely your home in certain places where you might eat. So this is a great time to empty those drawers, take out the cutlery from the little cutlery inserts, wash those, wipe those down. You know, those are great places for breadcrumbs and things to hide. Um, Go through your fridge compartments one at a time, take things out, wipe them down, and then when you put them back, read all of the labels so that you know what you can keep and what you can use that's gluten-free and you already have, and then what you might want to give away or use up for the other people in your house that does contain gluten. And I would encourage you to do the same thing for your food storage or your pantry, um, as well as all of your cooking utensils, especially paying more attention to things that are wood or bamboo or tend to be a bit more porous and have cracks where gluten can hide. Um, we in our clinic recommend getting a separate items for things that are difficult to clean. So these are going to be your toasters, um, your cast iron pans that you're not supposed to clean out very well, things like mesh colanders or flour sifters, all of these things we recommend um, getting a new one just so you can be sure that, uh, that they are gluten free going forward. Some other non-food concerns at home for kids especially are things like Play-Doh, craft supplies that include paints, glues, paper mache, um, over-the-counter medications, Tylenol, vitamins, supplements. Uh, there are some lotions that can contain oats in them and especially um, lipstick, play makeup, any kind of chapstick or something that you're putting on your lips or toothpaste. So uh, I know as adults, we don't really worry about toothpaste, but kids definitely, if, especially if they're still learning how to brush their teeth, may swallow these products. So all these things I've noted are things that have gluten in them um, that are theoretically fine for your child to touch and hold such as play-doh or um, you know playing with paints or glues however uh, we want to make sure that we're really washing hands very well before eating um, so that there is a decreased risk of your child swallowing these foods or swallowing these non-foods i guess um, so we're really only concerned about gluten that they might accidentally ingest. Uh, so having a routine of washing your hands before every meal and snack, or maybe sending some wet wipes to school so they can do that if they forget to go to the washroom before lunch. All of these things can be helpful in reducing the risk of having gluten. We're not usually as concerned in our clinic about things like shampoo and conditioner and things that are not very easily ingested. So for grocery shopping, we definitely recommend giving yourself more time to read your labels. So um, if you can, go without your kids, go without other distractions or, you know, needing to run into the grocery store for 30 minutes, you know, between soccer practice and dance practice. Really try to give yourself a lot of time. Read the labels on everything. Bring a fully charged phone with your gluten-free 24-7 app or the internet. Bring your pocket dictionary and a pen. Um, if it's your first time going grocery shopping, check out all your aisles in the grocery store because you might be surprised. Sometimes there's a natural food aisle where you can find gluten-free foods, but then sometimes you're gonna find your gluten-free food right next to the regular gluten-containing food. So really check all of those places out and make a list. It's very easy to get overwhelmed. I've had more than one parent tell me that they've had you know, tears in the grocery store just on their own. So take a break if you need to and that's okay. We suggest avoiding any kind of bulk food bin because we don't know if the scoops or containers have been cleaned adequately, and then avoiding may contain food labels. Um, I've had some patients in smaller towns who uh, say that when they started shopping, they couldn't find a lot of gluten-free food. However, um, their grocery store was willing to order a product, and I've seen that more with some companies where they even have like a pre-filled form that you can say, I'm interested in purchasing these Char products or these Glutino products. And you can give that to the grocery manager and they can even try to bring in some new products for you. So I would definitely recommend 
just chatting with the people at the store. Um, in regards to cooking your new gluten-free groceries, um, you may decide that you need to ease into the gluten-free diet. So I would recommend setting a goal for when you want to get to 100% compliance as soon as possible. So I've been seeing some families recently who are saying, you know, this is really not feasible for us until the school year ends. So I say, okay, well, my professional goal for you is to try to get on gluten-free 100% as soon as you can. So if that's going to mean, you know, July 1st for you, um, then I'm going to support that. So what I suggest is maybe say, okay, let's focus on breakfast. Can we get a whole bunch of gluten-free breakfast ideas and get more confident getting breakfast to be gluten-free? And then once we have that, let's add in lunch. And then let's add in snacks per supper so that we don't maybe overwhelm ourselves with getting too swamped with going gluten-free for the entire day. We still recommend involving your child in cooking and in the kitchen at whatever age um, that works for them. So uh, you know, get them stirring things, get them, ha get their hands dirty with uh, cooking. We want to make sure we're still fostering a good relationship with food. And then I recommend trying some basic naturally gluten-free recipes that are familiar to your family. You know, you might find that the chicken and rice and broccoli dish that you made the other night is going to be gluten-free and your family likes it and that's great. So let's just continue with that. Um, I do encourage trying to replace fast food with batch cooking because a lot of families have busy schedules and they eat on the go and in the car, but really, simply put, a lot of fast food options don't offer many nutrients or vitamins and they are at a very high risk for cross-contamination. So try making some freezer meals or some um, frozen burritos or something with gluten-free corn tortillas or batch cooking a large dish in advance so you eat a pack or heat leftovers if you're in a rush. And then try to take this opportunity to explore other cultures that use less gluten in their traditional foods. So maybe we're using corn tortillas instead of wheat tortillas for tacos. Or we could try a rice and Indian chickpea curry, um, maybe some sushi with gluten-free soy sauce. So um, this is a good opportunity to check those out. And then if you are eating out or on the run, ask lots of questions because you can actually go back there in the kitchen and cook and neither should you, you should have a relaxing dinner. Try to ask lots of questions to your server, ask to speak to the manager, let them know that your child has a specific health concern and it's not just a willy-nilly preference. If you can, try to call ahead if you've never been there or look at the menu online in advance so you can get a better idea of what you're working with and try to identify any kind of potential cross-contamination points like a deep fryer or pasta water or salad croutons. And I think that if you're able to try to be positive and calm and kind of normalize this experience with your child, they will pick up on that from you and also become more confident eaters outside of the house by asking those questions and being um, necessarily cautious. At school, we always recommend talking with the teacher, asking if there's a school policy about food sharing, um, if there are hot lunches, maybe we can organize that some gluten-free food gets, a gluten-free pizza gets ordered on pizza day, or maybe that means that we make a gluten-free pizza at home the night before and send a couple slices as well. Um, we recommend having a treat box or a treat bag with some, you know, mini candies or mini chocolate bars that are gluten-free so that you can leave that with your teacher. And if your child has some um, uh, birthdays or celebrations that were not upcounted for, they can pick a couple things in their treat box or stash and celebrate with the rest of the class. And um, I've had a couple of families decide to do presentations to the class. Uh, usually this works a little bit better if the child is younger, but they can do story time where they read, again, those children's books that talk about celiac disease, or even just talk a little bit about, you know, this is what makes me special, and um, this is why I can't share lunch with you. And I find that the feedback we get from some families who have done that is pretty positive. At friends' houses, outside of the house, birthday parties, we really recommend, again, talking and communication. So talk to your child's friends, parents in advance, offer to send food or feed them at home before or after your play date. Encourage your child if, um, to open up a little bit more to their friends and talk about celiac disease if it's age appropriate. Uh, again, planning ahead can really save you in some points. So bringing your gluten-free brownies or cupcakes so your child can still celebrate with other kids if they can't eat your birth the birthday cake that's being served. 
Um, and again, looking for gluten-free pizza options. A lot of times like snack foods at parties can be okay, like popcorn, chips, and sodas, and pops. So maybe we can use some of those kind of fun foods to still celebrate. Um, as Dominica alluded to, there are some nutrition gaps with the gluten-free diet. So notably, you can be deficient in folic acid, zinc, and B vitamins. So we look at offering sunflower seeds, you know, beans, mushrooms, leafy greens to make up for those nutrient deficiencies. A gluten-free diet can be lower in fiber. So we want to encourage lots of fruits and vegetables whole grains that are, uh, don't contain gluten, and then legumes and pulses as well. And gluten-free food replacements may add excess sugar and fat to make them taste good. So we, again, encourage lots of naturally gluten-free foods rather than just straight replacements of um, breads and crackers and cookies and those sort of processed grains. So my last slide here is about possible roadblocks. So we have kids definitely who hate gluten-free food. We've seen a few kids recently who have a lot of anxiety around new food, whether it's gluten-free or not, but just eating out of the house or anything. And I think that's definitely something that uh, can be induced by us because we're saying check everything, ask lots of questions, pay more attention to food. And then if, you, if your child does have some ongoing symptoms or growth concerns despite being on a gluten-free diet, um, that can absolutely be a roadblock. So we, I would say, try to plan for regular follow-up with your primary care provider and your GI team. Um, and, you know, reach out to your supports and your dietitian as well. If there's a way that we can still have clear boundaries that are loving but firm, you know, maybe we can try recipes that mimic your favorite gluten-free food. So trying those gluten-free donuts or going to that gluten-free bakery that has cinnamon buns, including those fun foods are still really helpful. Um, I know I'm telling you in one breath to, uh, to have lots of unprocessed healthy food, but also if your child is having a really bad time with gluten-free food, sometimes it's good to normalize that a little bit more to include some treat foods so they know they can still have those fun foods. Okay, thank you. So I didn't leave too much time here, um, but happy to answer any questions here or also um, afterwards. Thanks, Jessica. That, that was great. And, and Dominica. Um, just before we get to questions, I just, uh, in case we, we lose a few people uh, who need to go, um, busy moms and dads out there. If you enjoyed tonight's webinar, we encourage you to make uh, a donation to CCA uh, to help us keep providing education like we have today, investing in celiac research and advocating uh, to make food safer for your child and your families. Um, uh, donations can be made at celiac.ca or visiting Canada Helps and searching for the Canadian Celiac Association's national link. It's a secure site where you can get instant receipts and um, we appreciate your support. Um, now on to our questions. Oh, and I want to let everybody know that we will be sending a survey link to the participants to, um, to let us know about future topics and how we did tonight. So uh, feedback always makes us uh, a little bit better. So. Um, okay, so a question we have here is, any recommendations for corn tortillas or brands? Um, perhaps maybe that's different, Jessica? Um, I think that's a good question. I can't say that I know a, a lot of um, national brands for the corn tortillas, because the ones that I've seen here in Edmonton uh, are made by an Edmonton company called El Mercado. So if you're in Edmonton, those are the ones I would recommend. Typically what I suggest looking for are not those big eight or 12 inch tortillas. Those are almost always wheat based, but your corn tortillas are gonna be a lot smaller, maybe six inches in diameter. Usually they're white or yellow. And then um, the best thing you can do is try to read the ingredient list and make sure that they are just corn. Um, they do prepare a little bit differently, so they tend to dry out a little more. So while you have them out on your counter, I recommend covering them with a damp paper towel or maybe microwaving them with a damp paper towel just to soften them up a bit. But um, I'm sorry, I'm not able to recommend any specific brand at the moment that's just those are the traits I would look for if you're looking for a corn tortilla. What I'd like to add there is the um, the gluten-free certified uh, program. Um, so for some people who may not be familiar, maybe new to the diet, is 
um, the CCA lends uh, a logo to a brand to uh, manufacturers who've produced gluten-free products in a certified facility. So we know right from the very, how they source ingredients to how they process it to how they package it, it's uh, well under the threshold and carries our seal for gluten-free. So uh, if you're new and you're going through um, your grocery store, look for that logo. And if you Google, um, you go to our website, ci.ca or um, glutenfreecertification.com or glutenfreecert.com, um, you can you know, recognize the logo. And they actually have a list of the companies that have products, so you probably can find some uh, corn tortilla chips. I'm pretty sure there's uh, there's some vendors that we have a part of that. So that just gives you confidence knowing that when you see that logo, it's safe for you and your, your family to eat. So um, good question. So the next question we have is, I've heard, a glute, I've heard that gluten can impact a child's ability to focus and pay attention and can present as ADHD. I haven't been able to find a lot of information on this. Is it true that gluten can impact a child's focus or not? If so, can I find more information? So I think that's a Dominika question. I see she's unmuted herself already on that one. Yes, that's a, that's a good question. So um, firstly, there, there, as I know, there's no specific link between ADHD and celiac. However, I have often seen in my clinic, um, and you can imagine a child who is sitting in class but suffering from bloating, uh, uh, tummy pain, maybe regurgitation, heartburn, various symptoms, um, maybe even needing to use a washroom. Some patients with celiac present with constipation. So you can imagine that child who is dealing with these various um, medical, medical um, manifestations would have a difficulty time, would have difficulty focusing at school. I have heard from patients, you know, my child had all these outbursts and we had a lot of behavioral concerns at home and then when we went gluten-free it's like it all settled and I do think that there that children I, I think children have sometimes a difficulty expressing some of the symptoms that they're experiencing which then come out as either behavioral concerns lack of focus in the classroom and this is how I can link it to this to see that but not specifically where the gluten TT, the TTG translocates to the brain and causing some physiologic changes. Um, research in this area has been done specifically looking at gluten-free diet and autism, and there's some research looking at there, and even there, the research is not um, definitively showing a link between, between the two. So I think it's more the, that there could be behavioral changes related to symptoms that the child may not be expressing, but affecting uh, their performance at school. Yeah, that's very interesting. Thank you, Dominica. Uh, we have another question. Um, are there any regular meetings for parents with celiac kids in Toronto? I'm new to Canada and one year into diagnosis have no support. So I can maybe ask answer that question. So um, Lisa, if you want to call the CCA office, um, it's 905-507-6208. And you can ask for extension um, 222, but just call, go to our website, celiac.ca, and you'll be able to get our phone number. Um, while Toronto uh, doesn't have like a lot of regular meetings, they've got about two a year. Uh, there are people we can connect you with who can give you some support. Uh, and we even have a few newcomers who have offered to take the lead and help. Like for example, there's a woman who's um, Muslim, um, an Arab, so she helps people with the struggles with halal diet. She's vegetarian and the celiac gluten diet. So um, definitely there we can support you by, if you call the office, we can, we can coordinate with you with at least some, um, some folks in the Toronto area. Um, I have a question, um, Halloween um, strategies. Um, Jessica, can you help answer, maybe give us a few quick tips on I know we're a ways away from, from Halloween, but there may be some, some quick tips you could give on uh, gluten-free and, and children. Yeah, great question. So um, I can't remember the link off the top of my head, but I'm pretty sure there's a gluten-free Halloween list. Melissa, maybe if you happen to know this, feel free to chime in. Um, I feel like I saw a website a couple of years ago that outlined a lot of um, candies around Halloween time and uh, that listed them as gluten-free. Now, 
I believe it was Canadian, but again, it could be American, which does change a few things. Yeah, because um, ingredients can change. So when you present a list, sometimes like the next day, it could be incorrect. Maybe someone's changed the formula. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I, like a good example of that is Smarties. So on a lot of American products, it's going to list Smarties as gluten-free, but their Smarties are actually what we call rockets in Canada. And that's why they're gluten-free, but our like chocolate Smarties are a completely different product and not gluten-free. So um, what I've had some families say work for them in the past is to do a trade-off with their kids. So they buy some gluten-free candy that they, or that they know their child is going to like. Um, so I think last year it was maybe Starburst or Skittles and uh, kept those, you know, didn't give those out. And then their child went out to go trick-or-treating and came back. And then before, you know, we delved into any candy, they did a switch with the child. So they poured everything out and said, okay, I'll trade you this for your coffee crisp. And so the they still got the experience of dressing up and going out and having candy, um, but then the parents knew what was safe and they um, went through the, the candy stash with the child. So absolutely, I would say try to make sure you educate your child beforehand on what they can or can't have. And then, of course, the new stuff that they're going to get that you didn't talk about is something that you should talk about together. Um, I've had other families who have said, yeah, we dress up and then we just have a party at home. We don't go trick-or-treating out anymore because that's too stressful for us. But at least we have a party, we do something fun, and you can still wear costumes and have friends over. So if you feel like that might work for your family or your child, that's something else that I would recommend. Um, and then a lot of times the snack size or the little Halloween size version does not have any ingredients on it. So that's a great place to look on the website or um, check the full size packaging if you're in the grocery store and use that information. Um, and again, it will require a little bit of planning ahead or checking on your phone as much as you can uh, so that you can be informed even with those tiny portion sizes. Oh, great tips. And actually, I think um, Sue Newell, um, who's a CCA expert for us, did a Halloween Facebook Live. So if anybody wants to go to our Facebook public page, um, you'll go to the video section. And Sue did, I think, two talks around the Halloween time. And you can check those out or, you know, check them out closer to the, the time of Halloween. So that's a, a resource for, for everyone as well. But another question here from Lilo. Do you have any advice for gut healing nutrition, supplements, et cetera, of CF, I'm not sure that is, removal of gluten from the diet. Dietary advice seems to focus on the latter, not the former. Um, Melissa, maybe I'll just have a thought on that. Um, uh, we, when it comes to bacteria flora, so I was, what, my, what I'm getting at is maybe some probiotics, but um, so we do know that the bacteria flora in patients with uh, celiac disease is different in their small intestine compared to patients without. What we don't know is, is that what led to celiac disease or is, are those different bacteria a consequence of having celiac disease? So we're not sure, but uh, some, some patients with celiac disease do go and take a probiotic. I think the important thing if you do start a probiotic is to make sure that it's gluten-free because they will have gluten added sometimes to them. But that may be one uh, supplement that some people take that may help uh, with, their, with their bowels. Um, and then I've mentioned the other, I mean, the other supplements we mentioned were uh, vitamin D supplements and adequate calcium, not so much specifically for gut healing, but overall uh, nutritional health. Okay, great. Um, Gordon, and, um, sorry, Melissa. I'll oh, just, go ahead, Jessica. Okay, I just wanted to say also you talked about Lilo um, supplements and like gut healing. And I just wanted to put in a plug in case you were thinking of things that you might have seen at your health food store, like gluten cutter or digestive enzymes that so, claim yeah, to break one. down gluten, that we don't endorse those. And we have not seen any evidence that they work in celiac disease and they're quite... Um, they're not easy to get the ingredient information on there. Like everything is generally quite proprietary. So I would say if you're thinking of those things, we would caution against them. Unfortunately, if your child is glutened, there's not really a lot we can do to kind of speed up that digestion process or anything, but you can manage their symptoms. So if they're having some stomach pain, maybe it's a hot water bottle or you know a heated blanket or just some extra downtime while they 
deal with it, but unfortunately there isn't any kind of magic pill or anything that will help. Okay, yeah, good uh, good tip in there. And actually CCA did come out with a, an article on that in our recent magazine. So if anyone wants to go to our uh, website, uh, if you type in Canadian celiac, you can pull up our latest May issue of our mag online magazine and there's an article by one of our registered dietitians about that very topic. So um, Gord's asking a question here, is, pediatric, is a pediatric gastroenterologist the best person to be treating a celiac child? Is that uh, who I should be looking for in my area? So Dominique, I think that's for you. Yeah, so definitely a pediatric gastroenterologist should be the person to diagnose uh, a patient with celiac disease. I do see many patients come to me uh, who are started on a gluten-free diet when their celiac serology may not have been high enough. And I would have done a biopsy, for example, and pediatric gastroenterologists do the biopsies. Um, I think an ex, a family doctor and, a, and an excellent pediatrician could be very good at following a patient uh, regularly for celiac disease. Um, I think many pediatric gastroenterologists might find it challenging to follow all our patients with celiac disease. We, I definitely like to follow my patients uh, for the uh, for the early uh, portion until they're really well established and then sometimes I do follow them uh, on as well. Um, so and then uh, I think from a patient perspective what's important is that uh, children and adults who are diagnosed with celiac disease should have annual blood work. They should have a you know their celiac screen annually, they should check their blood counts annually, their ferritin levels, um, their TSH because of high risk of thyroid, uh, thyroid disorders. So I think those if can be done certainly through a family doctor or a pediatrician. Um, um, but sometimes I guess if you uh, work with somebody who's always doing celiac disease, we, we might remember that, but, but you can certainly work with, a, with an excellent family doctor, excellent pediatrician. Um, the benefit of the pediatric gastroenterologist is that often many of us do have a dietitian in the clinic to help, uh, and that's working with the patients who are really sometimes struggling with the gluten-free diet or new to it. Okay, great. Um, question, once your child goes on a strict gluten-free diet, uh, if they are exposed to gluten, would you expect the same symptom to reoccur? Good question. Uh, that they had before or different? For example, my son had a muscle cramp, so it would seem to be the same again if he was, would it seem to be that he'd have the same again if he was gluten or another symptom? Great question. That is an excellent question. Um, because the answer is we don't know. Um, some, uh, some patients are completely asymptomatic. 20% of patients have no symptoms. So they're very challenging because we don't even, but the other thing is I've anecdotally through friends who have celiac disease will express that they get profuse violent vomiting if they're exposed to gluten. And this is a symptom they never had prior to the diagnosis. So in fact, patients may have different symptoms and they may be asymptomatic as well. So your son may not necessarily develop you know, the muscle cramps again, but he may have other symptoms or be asymptomatic. So that is a challenge uh, to know if you've potentially been exposed to gluten if you don't know what symptom to be looking for. And so that's um, some of those other extraintestinal features like the oral ulcers, um, the bloating, um, tummy pain, that you looser stools, that vomiting that you might you might see if you've been exposed to gluten. Great, uh, great, great question. Um, another question, if my son tested positive for DQA uh, 105, um, hopefully you guys can see this, DQA, um, as well as positive A, uh, ATTG or it's the ITTG level, not overly high, does he still require a scope? I hope you can read this because I've, I've really butchered that question. This is an excellent question because I get frequent referrals with this scenario. So I think it's important to remember that the HLA DQ2 and DQ8 are positive in 40% of the general population and usually about 80% of first degree relatives. So the fact that you are positive for these HLA markers simply means you have the genetic predisposition for celiac, but it doesn't mean you have it. Now, the second part of the question is that the, the TTG is positive, but not very high. So, I, so that depends. Um, you know, if a patient's had a positive TTG on multiple occasions, I usually repeat the TTG every three to four months to see where the trend is. And if it's really been positive and slightly increasing over that time, it may 
it may suggest that the, that he should go for a scope. We I've done a study and we looked at patients when their TTG was only three times the upper limit of normal. And here in Alberta, we do an EMA in, in Calgary. So if the TTG was low and the EMA was negative, we only found uh, celiac, only 13% of those patients actually had a celiac disease uh, diagnosed on the biopsy. So we know that if we go ahead with the biopsy too soon, when the TTG is not very high, because celiac disease is patchy and it can be mild, we might miss it. So I think the important thing is to know that just having the HLA markers um, means you have the genetic predisposition, which is common in the population. Secondly, if the TTG is only positive on one occasion, I'd probably repeat it three to four months later to watch the trend. And if it's still only mildly high, know that you might go for a biopsy. And in fact, it might not show conclusively that he has celiac and then you would be planning another biopsy, let's say in a year from now as you follow the TTG and then it goes up again. Okay, yeah, great, that is a great question. Um, so just one last question, then we'll wrap up because let's we'll watch people's time here. What is the dosage of vitamin D for children? So that's a great one for probably Jessica. Hi, Irene. So the recommended dietary allowance for vitamin D in children as set out by Health Canada in infants less than 12 months is 400 international units or 400 IUs a day. And then in children um, up to 18, they list it as 600 international units a day. So that being said, uh, depending on where you live in Canada, but most likely a lot of us in Canada end up being quite vitamin D deficient during the winter months. It is our practice in our GI clinic at least to monitor vitamin D levels um, in our patients with celiac disease because they might have some malabsorption as well. So we, um, I would say th that would be the minimum that I would recommend and that in our clinic we do tend to go a little bit higher such as 800 or a thousand units if we can see based on blood work that um, the child has low vitamin D levels that way and there are a few different ways to administer it as well so I would say aim for 400 or 600 IU, uh, international units depending on the age of your child um, but if you're not, you know, if you're missing supplements or uh, your child isn't eating a lot of vitamin D containing foods such as fortified dairy and fatty fish um, or eggs, then it would be good to maybe check that with your uh, physician and then you can adjust the dose depending on what that looks like. We've actually created a uh, tip sheet out of one of our Facebook live sessions the other day. We had a registered dietitian and she's um, sourced the Dietitians of Canada PEN website. So we do have one on iron and one on calcium um, that are on our website. So if you go to the celiac.ca and click off the awareness month, and under that there is um, top six signs of um, atypical signs. And in there we have the different things like anemia, bone loss, and we do have some tip sheets that have been sourced and have some charts and some suggested food intake. So um, have a look at that or contact our office uh, uh, communications at celiac.ca or info at or give us a call and we can email those to you. So hopefully everybody's in here the train in the background. And we do have one last quick question that came in. Have you seen celiac patients present with chronic sinus congestion as a symptom? Personally, I have not. Um, but um, ATP or allergic rhinitis and sinus congestion is common. And then uh, I see 20% of my patients who have no symptoms of celiac disease. They are completely asymptomatic and screened either because their family member has it. So maybe it could be that the sinus congestion is due to a second something else. And in fact, also to remember that about 20% of patients have celiac patients have absolutely no symptoms that we could clearly, clearly identify. So I haven't personally. Uh, um, Gordon has one last question. Do you have time to answer? Do you believe celiac can be onset right from birth? Uh, so no, the, you're born with the genetics. You're born with the HLA, DQ2, DQ8. Yes, that is what you're born with. Uh, but you need to be exposed to gluten uh, for some period of time to develop the intestinal changes and uh, the symptoms. So um, yes, you're born with a genetic predisposition to celiac if you're HLA DQ2 or DQ positive, but um, I have not seen a patient and I don't, I've never seen it reported that a patient has been diagnosed with C. I think the youngest I've seen diagnosed is around 18 months 
So they yes. were the gluten starting around six months and then about a year after that started to develop the symptoms that then prompted the blood work. Thank you all for participating on International Celiac Awareness Day and we look forward to bringing some more education um, the coming weeks and months and over the course of the year. So thanks everyone and have a wonderful evening.